Greetings, family. Welcome to the African Exodus Show. I'm your host, Tierney Cherie, here to you with a new video. Before we get started, if you have not already and you want to get notifications anytime I post a video or you just want to stay connected outside of YouTube in case my channel goes down, which is always a risk, you can subscribe to my Telegram channel. The link to that is in the description. So today we're going to talk about a very serious issue, and that is our children. The most serious thing that you, the biggest thing you should be serious about in the world is our children because our children literally are our future the children are the world that we leave behind the children are going to plan our way out of certain catastrophes that we've dealt with as a people so it's important to always put emphasis on them because many of us especially those of us who are elders we might have put our imprint on the world but their imprint is yet to be seen when it comes to us, the children of Yasharel, we should understand that our children are a prized possession and one that has been sought after from the early, early stages of our people. Obviously, we know about the captivity of Africans inside, or excuse me, the, the captivity of Yasharel inside of Egypt. What happened? That our children, our firstborn male sons, were put into the river now. We also know that under the rule of Herod, that many of our children were killed inside of Bethlehem because they were after our children. Understand, them being after our children has never ended, has never stopped. In fact, I want to read from a scripture. You shall therefore take these words of mine to heart and to soul, and you shall tie them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. You shall also teach them to your son, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. This is what we're instructed to do. Teach our children at all steps of the, all times of the day, all steps of their lives. Teach them about the word. Teach them about the law. Teach them to respect the law. Teach them what happens if we don't respect the law. Because when you read actually the next scripture, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that your days and the days of your sons may be increased on the land which Yahuwah swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. For if you are careful to keep all of his this commandment, which I am commanding you to love Yahuwah, your Elohim, to walk in all his ways, to cling to him, then Yahuwah will dispossess all the nations from you and will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place on which the sole of your feet steps shall be yours. Your border will be from the wilderness to Lebanon and from the river, the river Parath, correct to be specific, as far as the Western Sea. So this is what has been told to us. There are consequences for us not controlling what our children are taught. There are consequences for us not being in a position to teach our children. And there are consequences to us letting other people teach our children. This is what we're going to talk about today. Why they want our children. Why they want to teach our children. I don't know about you, but I noticed an obsession with black children that I don't see with other children. I noticed an obsession with black people, to be honest, that I don't see with other people. I see an obsession of a people trying to teach us things that, that we are have not done historically. I see a, a an obsession with depictions inside of media of us being in certain compromising positions that we have not been in historically. So there's an obsession with us. And the reason is because of who we are, we obviously know. But I want to talk to you about the American public education system. I'm going to read through an article in the American public education system, Black Children Are Now the New Cotton. This was a very good article. I was surprised that it comes from the Huffington Post, but um, this looks like an independent writer. His name was Christopher Stewart, guest writer, but very good article. We're going to read through some of this. W.E.B. Du Bois warned us in 1935 that turning black children over to white America for their daily education risks making them doormats to be spit and trampled upon and lied to by ignorant social climbers whose sole claim to superiority is the ability to kick niggers when they are down. We didn't listen. More than a century later, the majority of black children sit in classrooms with mostly white teachers who think very little of their potential and humanity. Years ago, civil rights leader Julian Bond told us, violence is, is black children going to school for 12 years and receiving six years worth of education. The six out of 12 years worth of education that the, he said our, our kids get is, in my estimation, little more than rote memorization and state-sponsored cultural suicide intended to vaccinate young black minds against free thoughts and self-determined lives. Yes, this is the Huffington Post, believe it or not. So historian and journalist Laron Bennett Jr. wrote about the post-slavery years saying in 1865, when emancipation became a fact, about one in every 20 Negroes could read and write, 
35 years later, more than one out of every two could read and write. 122 years later, less than one in five black fourth graders are proficient in reading. This is what happens when we turn our children over to the system of education. You may be surprised to learn that none other than Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. himself warned us against blind trust in public schools and their children and their teachers. Two of his parishioners, both black high school educators, said he told them white people view black people as inferior. A large percentage of them have a very low opinion of our race. People with such a low view of the black race cannot be given free reign and put in charge of the intellectual care and development of our boys and girls. Yet what have we done? We've literally done the exact thing. We know that these people are, are antagonistic towards us, yet we turn our children over to them to be educated in the public education system. Yeah, here we are every morning turning over 8 million black children, the minds of our race and hope of our future to an education system owned and operated by white governors, billion dollar textbook companies, 3 million white, mostly white teachers and 14,000 school boards composed of members who are generally whiter, wealthier and more Republican than the students they supposedly represent. Now, I'm sure that more Republican might have triggered some of you. Some of you, I understand, are conservative, but go on to read the article. He actually puts do, uh, do blame on both sides. So this part says the war on black education from left to right. In the American public education system, black children are the new cotton. They are a headcount that generates revenue for a national army of experts who fight fiercely to keep our kids per pupil revenue locked up in whatever cartel they control. Black youth are the most studied and least taught. Ooh, that is deep. We're the most studied, and it's true. Uh, all of you who want to, if you went to a four-year university or whatever type of education you received, I remember as soon as I went to college, all I was studying and studying was how bad we were doing. It's the same thing in law school. Yet, we're the least taught, though, though we're the most studied. They are the perfect captives because you can raise funds for their body without ever being accountable for improving their minds. Black Lives Matter. <laughs> raise, buck, raise, raise, raise money for our bodies, right? All they want to say is black bodies, black bodies, but nothing of our minds. After years of thinking about education reform and studying the policies of America's political right and left wings, I came to a provocative conclusion about all of this. It is this. If you want to ensure that black people never reach their full potential, there will be no more efficient way to make that happen than to demand we turn over our babies at age five to the American public education system. I want to say again, I'm so surprised this is the Huffington Post. Maybe you are too. Because this is literally the truth that most types of, uh, of news entities will try to censor. Turning your children over to the public education system, American public education system, but I dare say public education system in this entire world controlled by the same powers that control America, that is something that is literally, it becomes at a certain point, like, are we sacrificing ourselves? Are we sacrificing our children for convenience? Sorry, are we? Are we sacrificing our children for the convenience of knowing that I'll get to go to work while they'll be busy doing something? Are we honestly, sincerely invested in what they're learning and who is teaching them? White conservatives and progressives aren't opposing forces. They are joint stakeholders in our ed educational captivity. To maintain their power, each finds its token black voices, corporate assimilated blacks on one side versus script unionist adherents on the other. To slog it out on social media and white paper mandingo fights as if either side could ever do us justice. Evidence of the anti-black bias in teaching starts early. When black students have white teachers, they are viewed as older than they are. They are seen as less innocent. They are less likely to be identified as gifted, more likely to experience exclusionary discipline, and more likely to experience lower classroom expectations. And I don't care how much CRT training you try to do to teach someone to act appropriately towards our children. The fact is that it's been so ingrained into you by the time that you even enter college that there's no undoing that racism that you have accumulated. So this, is, again, is a very good article. You can read the whole thing. Here's another aspect of this. Obviously, we're to teach the law to our children. Can we do so inside of the American education system or do we have to separate? Sorry, everyone had to change cameras because my other camera memory card is full, but I want to finish this video very quickly. So we'll do so from this view. I believe we're going to be put inside a position within the next three to five years as a people. 
where, and honestly, depending on where you are, that this condition exists today, where if we are making the choice to keep our children inside of the public education system, we are literally choosing to turn them over to Babylon. We're choosing to allow our children to be indoctrinated with things that go against Yahua. And this is a hard pill to swallow because one of the ways that the system operates in order to get us to comply with it in many factions, but in this particular faction is by giving us convenience. Public education is a convenience. It is something that is free where many of our people are struggling financially. It is something that we have come to see as just a part of life. You send your children to school. If you can afford private, okay, cool, but really just do public. But I'm telling you that this was an inten intention of the system to make us dependent on them in order to manipulate us inside of other ways because many of us could never see a world without depending on public education. Like it might already be the case that you have literally sacrificed your children learning the true laws of Yah and learning what is right and what is wrong. You might have had to already done that, sacrificed your children in order to have that convenience because of how the system has us. So the issue is dependency. We can't depend on a wicked system. I'm sorry. That's that's literally the way that you're going to compromise integrity, compromise righteousness. If you depend on a wicked system, once you identify that Babylon is what it is, that Babylon is a system, Babylon is a spiritual system, it's an economic system, it's a political system, and that system is inherently evil, you have to make a decision. Are you going to be a part of it? Are you going to participate in it? Are you going to be set apart? Public education has been a way that they have tricked us many, many times. They've allowed us to think that it's, that it's innocent. They've allowed us to think that they weren't doing anything detrimental. Meanwhile, they're teaching our children in enslavement mentalities. Meanwhile, they're teaching our children to be servants. Meanwhile, they're teaching our children to serve them. And meanwhile, they're slowly trying to trinkle in morality that goes against the true morality, trying to trinkle in things that go against the law of Yahuwah. They've been slowly infusing that at a gradual pace because, frankly, if you just start off controversial from the beginning, you're not going to get a good reaction uh, from the people. So you'll do things slowly over time. You'll just start with, oh, we're just introducing sex education and we're going to, you know, just teach them, you know, things about their periods and things about productive organs, but nothing beside that. And I remember as a kid um, learning that and it was kind of like out of place. Why am I learning this in school? But, you know, it wasn't outward like it is today. They weren't going into details like they are today. They started us off with one one thing so that they could take it to turn a notch up 20 times way down the road so this has always been a plan of the public education system it's always been planned by them and now we're just seeing the fruits of it so like i said many of us are going to have to make a decision are we going to offer our children up to babylon are we going to be serious when we say we are a set apart people that is the entire point of this segment saying as the scripture says we are to be set apart we are not to be like the world our children are most detrimental in this fight because they are still influenced by the world their thoughts are being formed their ideas are being formed and that's why Yahuwah yeah, told us to teach them early so that they can learn righteousness because what you learn at an early stage is going to follow you throughout your entire life if they're learning things that confuse the truth that confuse nature at a young age then they're going that confusion is going to be very hard to undo that distortion of facts is going to be hard to shine light on to a grown adult so this is the example that I want to go through very quickly now I noticed that Critical race theory. People have been using that as a way to say that we're going to fix the education system. We're going to make it right by we're going to teach by teaching critical race theory. I noticed early on that this critical race theory was a Trojan horse because what I noticed is that it's always simultaneously kind of mixed in with the intersectionality theory, uh, agenda, which is pu pushing the idea that racism and um, and LGBT issues are one and the same, which they never have been and never will be these are completely different issues i obviously want everyone to be treated with dignity but to try to conflate one with the other that is not true now read this this article i'm going to read to you about critical race theory this is from um the critical race theory internet sectionality of race gender and social justice it says critical race theory emerged in the mid 1970s and it began with the legal scholars it emerged with it emerged partly from legal critical studies and civil rights movement of the 1960s in the U.S. 
but let's just emphasize this originated with legal scholars. These legal scholars scrutinized how law upheld the white privilege regarding race, gender, class, etc., because of its power dynamics rather than the principles guiding the law. As such, many legal decisions were based on racial discrimination rather than judiciously just observations. Besides critical legal studies, CRT largely depends on critical theory, post-colonialism, continental social and political philosophy, and feminism, particularly feminist jurisprudence, which in turn gave rise to critical race feminism. Additionally, the other offshoots of CRT besides CRF includes LATCRIT, which also which emphasizes Latino and Latina concerns. Asian crit, which looks at marginalizing issues faced by and within Asian communities, whereas gay and lesbian scholars are developing queer race crit theories, respectively. Critical race theory utilizes many methodologies and has a number of key theoretical underpinnings. CRT writing focuses on some of the following major themes. Racism should be understood as a social and not a biological construct, which I've never personally believed, but it's only racism is only a social construct, they say. Nothing to do with bloodlines or anything like that. A critique of liberalism that is equality for all, essentialism and anti-essentialism, legal instruct institutions. Critical pedology and minorities, discriminatory status in the courts, intersectionality of race, gender, sexuality, and class, criticism and self-criticism, use of biographies, autobiographies, stories, and counter stories by employing humor and satire, the praxis of CRT. The three main concepts or ideas coming out of critical race theory, which can form the basis for literary anthropological and sociological inquiry are the role of law in dispensing and upholding ending racial discrimination at the judicial and civil levels, the intersectionality of race, gender, sexuality, and class, the use of fiction, nonfiction, and autobiographical narratives used for showing racial oppression, discrimination, self-reflection, and suggestive methods for possible solutions aiming at achieving sustainable equality. So there's a number of things, as you can see, that get mixed in when it comes to critical race theory, which is why I say it's a Trojan horse, because all of us want our children to be taught the truth about America. Everyone wants, the, wants America to have a light shine on it. As far as who the founders were, the white supremacists who founded America through a genocide on people who are, were indigenous, through the enslavement of America, everyone wants that line to be light to be shown. But as we know, as the scriptures say, that things like queer theory, things like LGBT um, propaganda, those things go against what the scriptures say. That's just what it says. Read it yourself. If we're to teach the laws of Yah, if we're fighting for a critical race theory that's going to be, again, a Trojan horse and introduce things that we did not think were being introduced for the sake of saying that we taught history correctly from a black perspective, then again, we are sacrificing our children's integrity or sacrificing the law of Yahuwa in order to capitulate to this new system that's being given to us. So that is to say that we should understand that People use things in order to get among us. People use things in order to influence us. People use ideas, Black Lives Matter being the clearest example, in order to te teach us that they're, or tell us that they're on our side even when they're not, or tell us that they're teaching one thing when they're teaching another. Understand that we're putting ourselves in a situation where we're in dependency on a system to educate our children, where they're able to educate them according to what they see fit. You will never know everything that your teacher is teaching your child. You'll never know everything that's being taught to your child or being sold to your child because you're not there all the time. But what you can know is that if you are among God's people and you put yourself amongst our people, when it comes to educating the children and when you're educating them yourselves, then you can know that righteousness is being taught. So this is just a, re a wake up call to you all. If we're serious about being set apart from the system, we have to take things like not just homeschool serious because that's not going to be for everyone, but school that is separate apart and privately owned by people who you know are of integrity who are going to teach our children correctly. So that's all I have for this video. Love to hear your thoughts. I'll see you on the next video. Inside Washington's Museum of the Bible, a single volume that is like no other, the so-called Slave Bible, remarkable not for what's in it, but for what's not. 
So about 90% of the Old Testament's been removed and about 50% of the New Testament's been removed. Uh, to put it another way, a normal King James Version has 1,189 chapters in it. Uh, the Slave Bible has only 232. Missing are chapters and verses that might have encouraged uprisings. Book of Exodus, redacted. No story of Moses demanding Pharaoh, let my people go. Gone is Galatians, and the verse, There is neither bond nor free, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And no Jeremiah, woe unto him that useth his neighbor's service without wages. What they've left in are verses such as Ephesians 6.5, which is the famous verse, Slaves be obedient to your master. Looking at the... This is First African Baptist Church, the oldest black church in North America. The building built by slaves. The gentleman that laid the first brick laid the last. The balcony hold pews that actually were built by slaves. They have the oldest information in this building. That information is written in cursive Hebrew writing. It's written in cursive Hebrew writing. Something came to us earlier about who we were and that we were um, uh, direct descendants. My family is direct descendants from Harriet Tugman, um, and she's from the same area that this tribe is visiting Philadelphia. Is from. And so we had to come and worship with you guys today. And we're super excited. It's just um, a thrill right now to be a part of this this whole celebration. And so, brother and sister, what was Harriet Tubman's name before she changed her name to Harriet? And what significance does that have to us as Hebrews? Her, her name was, before she changed her name, after she uh, ran away, her name was Araminta Ross. And Araminta is a Hebrew, a Hebrew name. Uh, her family um, knew, knew that they were uh, from the Ashante tribe and uh, which is is now uh, part of Ghana and that they were uh, Hebrew they they did have Hebrew um, names before they were um, in slavery thank you so much and as we read a little bit you can find the Ashante tribe actually in the book um, the Old Testament the Ashant, I believe is Ashant mm -hmm. which is now interpreted in Shante. So yeah, so it was really exciting to find someone that is actually our descendant who is Hebrew and from, from right out of the book. Harriet Tubman became known as the Moses of her people due to her contributions in facilitating the Underground Railroad. What is often not taught regarding Harriet is that she was given a Hebrew name at birth. Additionally, Many of her relatives carried names of Hebrew origin. Harriet's birth name was Aramanita, which is a given name in Hebrew meaning lofty, noble, or elevated in character and spirit. Here we have provided a short list of a few of her relatives along with the meaning of their names in Hebrew. Harriet's sister, Lina, Hebrew name meaning dwelling or lodging. Harriet's sister, Maria, Hebrew name meaning Yahuwah has said or Yahuwah is my teacher. Harriet's brother, Ben, Hebrew name meaning son, with the full rendering Benjamin meaning son of my right hand. Harriet's sister, Rachel, Hebrew name meaning or little lamb. Harriet's brother, Moses, name meaning to deliver or to draw out. Harriet's niece, Kasaya, Hebrew name generally understood as meaning sweet scented spice, 
through the collaborative efforts of researchers at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute of Harvard University, and other research institutions around the world, the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database has already provided empirical evidence that thousands of the men, women, and children who were transported from the shores of Africa had names of Hebrew origin, though the slave owners deliberately stripped away much of their language and customs, we can still see evidence that our forefathers, who were led away into captivity, maintained some recollection of their heritage and identity. 